Last year it was the shimmy shake in the dust and the year before that it was the golden gowns. That's Jenny Lee. She and Charles Arroyo, who owns the place now, uh, founded this initially down in San Pedro and they moved up here in 1981. This place, whole place was condemned. It used to be a goat ranch. Yeah. So, uh, Jenny didn't move up here until about 86 because it took that long to put everything together. But these girls, I've got a dressing room table, and I mean a, a dressing room trailer over here, and they do their preliminary makeup and costumes, mm -hmm. and then they come around this way and they have another dressing room in the back that they go into and finalize their preps, mm -hmm. and then they go over here. I'll show you where the pageant is. But I'm over here trying to flip hamburgers, and here the here comes these beautiful women wearing almost nothing, and I'm trying to not <laughs> drop the hamburgers on the on the ground. I mean, it, it's crazy. These three girls are sisters. They came from New Orleans for the pageant. This is Alex. She came down from Spokane, Washington. This is Bob. She won the tassel twirl off this year. She's from New York. Just finished uh, doing a gig down in the Virgin Islands. We have one group that, uh, of off-road motorcyclists that stayed with us for five days. And they camp out in the field. Uh -huh. I partied with them, I barbecued for them. And we had uh, two girls two different times. She's a big girl. She's taller than me. Uh, I need to go. And that's, oh, uh, they have And then here we have Catherine Delish in 1996. And as you can see, we had a pretty good crowd then. But every year it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's like, no, it's they're going to have to move the fence. <laughs> and then we got Elvis up here because Tempest and Dixie, in their time, both used to run around with him when they were in Vegas when he was there. I think a couple of them were donated. We do see them. Hello, Dixie. It's great to be here. We had a little trouble finding you, but <laughs> your directions were, were great. Oh, good, yeah. I, I don't usually have this, but I was sick for two years and finally had a major surgery, so wow. I'm walking a little strange right now. The doctor no doesn't want me to fall down. <laughs> Um, well, the word 
practice burlesque. And a lot of people say, oh, burlesque, well, just a bunch of tacky old strippers. Actually, burlesque is thousands and thousands of years old. Aristophanes up there, above the shadow box, is known as the father of burlesque. Because, you see, burlesque is comedy, mimicking the real and exaggerating. That's what comedy really is. You see, he realized 5,000 years before Christ, if you're an urchin in the street, you have nothing. What's funny to you? Nothing. But if a coach pulls up, it's got gold wheels, and the people are dressed so totally elegant, and then they step out of this elaborate coach, and they fall in a mud hole. <laughs> now that's funny to the person standing out there who has no hopes of ever having anything. So that's the core of burlesque and the core of comedy. Now, uh, we know the first exotic dancer, at least to my knowledge, was Solome and her seven veils. That's the first one. And then, of course, <clears throat> down through the ages, we have had exotic women, such as uh, Mata Hari, uh, which you know executed by the French firing squad. That's her in the little four pictures there. Some journalists brought me over from where she lives. Right, at, right, really, right across the street from where she would live. At any rate, uh, also Josephine Baker. There are thousands of them, but in the shadow box alone is the one and only American icon, Sally Rand. Yeah. Now, Sally Rand saved Chicago from financial ruin with two fans, and at the end of this tour, you're gonna see the fans that saved Chicago. <laughs> yeah, Great. that's true. Just talk in this little box we keep that money in our pocket. We don't have to travel anymore. But you know, girls like the Foster sisters, they had to join the burlesque show so they could keep working. And the theaters were tickled to death to have the fallout from uh, vaudeville <clears throat> into burlesque because it pumped up a lot of talent. Now I was the Marilyn Monroe of burlesque. <laughs> well, that used to be me. <laughs> you said you couldn't ever really meet or see the real Marilyn. Well, you could have come to the Burles Theater and see me. Oh, I might have shown you more than Marilyn. <laughs> and she tried to sue me, too. Did she? Yes, yeah. you'll see about that. And Marilyn and I are both the same age, and we're both from Hollywood. <laughs> Okay, enforcement and all of that, and we have to have these lights put in, which is very good and important. Oh, yeah. You know, because, see, if the power fails, the lights oh, go let's on. go on, yeah. Which is, I don't know how it manages to do that, but it does. But it's costing a lot of money to do it, but, we, but anyway, <coughs> they just leave everything, and then i got to try to put things back together. At any rate, this was used in the very last big burlesque show by Angela. She is a hairdresser in San Diego. I just talked to her yesterday. Uh, this was made by a girl when she was 17 years old, Sheila Ray. She is a retired nurse in Oxnard, California. And then, of course, on these walls, you will see pictures uh, that you probably will never see in a large collection like this again of the era. Now, the third row down, second one over, is a horse right from Trigger. That horse's name was uh, Melody, and the girl's name was Frances Dubay. Now, she did the act of Lady Godiva. So if you were sitting in the big burlesque show, you know, and the big velvet curtains opened up, why, she would be prancing on stage, my lord, my lord, you must lower the taxes on the poor people. But I will not lower the taxes on the poor people. My lord, you shall, for if you do not, I will ride to the streets of Covington nude on a horse. And as we know, Lady Godiva did make that statement for the oppressed people of her time. So uh, there again is an example of what these girls used to do to really entertain, to put on an act. We had so many. We had a lot of tassel uh, tossers and different types. Now names were clever and equally important. Uh, cupcake so Mason. <laughs> and then we had a tabby cat, a Harlow Angel, Kathleen McNamara, the unpredictable wild Irish rose. So if you see that in the paper, you're going to say, let's go see, see just how wild that yeah. gal can get. 
because there was no television for these girls to advertise or anything. It was just according to the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And that's Fred Astaire's cane up there that he used it at Fox when he would rehearse. It was for Flight of the Bumblebee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Belong to Jane? Oh, wow. Yeah, this is Jane Mansfield. Now, sitting in the where the heart goes down to a peak, a point, that's Jane sitting in this particular ottoman. Mr. Arroyo, who owns the 40 acres, knew Mr. Greenland. Uh, Mr. Greenland had a lot of theaters, and he bought the Jane Mansfield estate immediately after she, when the, well, they, when they sold it the first time. So in lieu of salary, Mr. Greenland said, well, you can take this if you want or anything. So they took yeah. this. Now in the corner is little Shirley Temple. I'm going to have a display for her, too. I've got my original Shirley Temple doll. Wow. That I got in the 30s, yes. Now you see, little Shirley Temple's first film was Baby Burlesque. It was a bunch of little babies yeah. trying to put on All a burlesque right, show. Yeah. Because, you see, when one industry uh, goes down and the new one that's coming up, it quick grabs the best of it can. So naturally the movies took a lot from burlesque and put in the films. Uh, a lot of the Leon Errol and all, a lot of comedies and mm -hmm. things they, they used from burlesque shows. Now I've got Shirley Temple's book and uh, it's really very, very good. She uh, told about how her mother had to make her costumes and do her hair and she got $50 a week. You see, everything had to have a champagne glass on it. I did not start the museum. Uh, Jenny Lee, the girl in the big picture there in the center, mm -hmm. she had a little bar in San Pedro called the Sassy Lassie Beer Bust Club. And her husband had the Blue Viking in San Pedro. But hit with catastrophic illness such as cancer, they had to alter their lifestyle. And they found this uh, 40 acres for a song. Uh, this was a goat shed when I came in here. And you, she couldn't have lived even in the, she died in the house. But you couldn't very well have lived there because it was, when this property was purchased, just a couple of little water, <coughs> you know what I mean, uh, like you've seen out in the desert, oh, blown that, away. That, mm -hmm. just, just, so they had to reconstruct the whole house. And this was the goat shed, and I mean, there were slats here and everything. I just had to push the trash from one room to the next. But you know, when I was in the hospital, they, they kept working on the cars and the trucks. No dusting. Boys don't dust. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the way that goes. Now this is the one and only Tempest Storm. All of the, these two, when I was in the hospital, a girl came out and really kind of uh, did an overkill on Tempest. <laughs> but uh, she lives in a trailer in the back. She's, uh, it's got gold water faucets, crystal chandeliers, and she uh, looks just like that right now today. That's her on my stage. She's got a 19-inch waist and mops and mops of that red hair. It's all her own hair. And when we leave the market, sometimes some ladies will whisper to me, that's not all her own hair. Oh, yes, it is. I'm there a lot of times <laughs> when she's washing and curling mm -hmm. her hair. Yeah, she lives just in the back. We had the Germans here for two days, and so my hair's kind of all out of curl now, too. Uh, she's going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame in uh, Las Vegas. Oh, Satan's Angel, she was here last week, uh, and she calls me all the time. She's got a website, and she's... So many of these kids are into the dot-com, and oh, they just... Get all kinds of stuff out. Anyway, that's Jenny Lee's bed, which was over in a house in Hesperia while the house was being put together mm -hmm. good enough to live in, you know. And I've had a lot of rain damages through the 13, 15 years I've been here. And so things get kind of out of sorts. Now that's little Miss Linda Dahl. Linda Dahl went with Elvis Presley during the filming of Viva Las Vegas. She was... Um, uh, from t uh, Tulsa. Everyone was a little more sophisticated or different than they do. But I like a lot of Elvis stories. Uh, there was one that uh, Elvis was had his big trailer just right a few hundred yards or yards was away was Marilyn Monroe's trailer. So Elvis's friend said, hey Al, why don't you go over there and, and introduce yourself and, and, and meet Marilyn Monroe? 
And he said, good Lord, man, I couldn't do that. That's Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> so it showed how humble and sweet, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And here he was very was, big yeah. and probably making a lot more money more because of the record sales and popular. Did you ever hang out with him? No, but in Miami, I... Um, my agent said uh, he was playing in the Olympic Theater. This was all the way back in 1994. Mm -hmm. five. And so we went and sat in the theater way at the back. And mm -hmm. then he whispered to me, when he does a certain song, we have to go in the alley back. Well, about three or four rows jumped up and followed because they knew where we were going. And there was a little table. And all he was doing was leaning back against his table. And the perspiration was just pouring off of him. And you couldn't hear the songs anyway, because they just screamed the whole time. Mm -hmm. But I got that close to them that I got to get some sweat. <laughs> I mean, I guess, I don't know. Yeah, I met Joe DiMaggio and Frank Sinatra, wow. and I've been with both of them. Yes, uh-huh. Wow, cool. But, uh, well, you see, uh, in the 50s, where we played in Miami Beach, the entertainers, it wasn't so strict. You could... They used to come to our club, the Sky Club was open until 5 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. My last show was quarter of 5. Whoa. I did four shows a night, and quarter of 5 was my last show. So they, the entertainers used to come down there and used to go there. You get them now, when they unwind and after their yeah, shows. Oh, huh? yes, yeah, yeah. that's true. You never want to just go, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. especially those, those, they used to come to the Yeah, well, would you at 5 o'clock in the morning? Well, we go out to the 79th Street Causeway, <laughs> which is open 24 hours a day. Uh, and you go out there, yeah. Wow. But it, it, was a, it was a tumble town and sort of like New York, same thing. You just kind of all blend in with one another and, you know. But now I understand the clubs in Vegas... They don't let the stars go to any other uh, clubs between mm. shows. Uh -huh. You have to stay in your own place. And uh, I don't know if you got a you, you know Louis Prima? Yeah, oh, sure. Okay. He's great. Well, you're too young to have ever been there during the 50s. Yeah. But let me tell you, the Desert Inn had the best act in the country, maybe the world. The best act. And you know, they couldn't make a dime because when Prima was on, that was a lounge show, mm -hmm. free. And, and, and you couldn't move, you couldn't get a drink, you couldn't do a thing because it was so jammed. And then everybody from all the other casinos would come. The croupiers would leave their tables and the bosses are hauling, the pit priests and the... You know, couldn't stay away from That was a free Prima show? Prima was an act uh, band you had to see wow. to appreciate. And then the witnesses, his band, oh, they do these challenges, you know, with the trombone and the saxophone, uh, Sam Butera and the... Oh, so there they had the best act, and it cost them money. Because <laughs> yeah, you couldn't move, you couldn't get to a bar, you couldn't do anything. It was wow. just jam solid, and he, he just mesmerized the audience. Now, I was very fortunate. I got to sit in a great big booth because my husband, the fighter, uh, was very good friends with Willie Pastrano. He mm -hmm. was just made champion of the world. He was from New Orleans, and uh, so was Prima. So uh, Prima... And Willie Pastrano, they had this big circle booth in the corner. So us being prize fight, we got to sit and I got to visit with Prima. But an entertainer can't talk between shows there, so... Yeah. <laughs> no, God, especially Prima. Oh, Keely Smith, I just saw her a couple of years ago, yeah, in Vegas. They're still the same. But I tell That's you, amazing. Prima was Prima. <laughs> now, the comedians and the comics, now they were the backbone of the show. We girls used to laugh and hee-haw and hee-haw, uh, peek through the curtains, because, see, our comedians were never permitted ever to swear or use a filthy, mm -hmm. vulgar word on stage. They didn't have to. They were just dumb and silly mm -hmm. and funny and would pull these silly, stupid antics all the time. And uh, they were the backbone of the show. Because, you see, you kids are so long, young, it's almost impossible for you to realize there was a world out there before television, you know. <laughs> And between all the lovely acts on the burlesque show, now out come the comedians. They're always broke. They're always skirting the law. They're always trying to get by on a day-by-day -day basis. Same thing as that audience is out there. That audience is trapped with no money, no job, and no hope. The only thing they had was to fall into one of these little old burlesque theaters. If they didn't sell a vacuum cleaner, they'd have to go home to their family. So... The Burlesque Theaters was a very wonderful venue for the American people of that time in history when there was nothing available to them. In fact, the working class people were made to feel inferior and undesirable. So for the sake of the Minskys, I, we could produce shows for these people for just a few pennies in the afternoon and a little bit more at night. And so 
that was the, uh, and also the big success of the Burles Theaters, no stage weights. Boy, that show just rolled like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And that public loved it because they didn't want to have to think of what's happening outside, that they spent their last dime to get into this theater. But when they went out, they were happy mm -hmm. because it was a little release. So a lot of these uh, uh, burlesque big stars from the 40s, they, most of them stemmed from the uh, burlesque show. Now this is the very first and the oldest burlesque theater in the United States, the old Howard, there's the H, Boston, Massachusetts. It was a church in the 1700s, wow. and then it became a burlesque show. Now they've torn it down and they put City Hall over the top. And I guess they said, let's just bury everything here in the basement and put the City Hall over the top of it. This is that little Shirley Jean uh, when she was uh, three years old, four maybe. Oh, it's the, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 little flat, yeah well, she was in the yeah. Our Gang comedy. Yeah. Uh, well, there was Darla, but... There was a couple little gangs at that time. It was so mm -hmm. big, the little rascals, and there was a couple others. Tommy Dorsey's opening night on Hollywood Boulevard. I'm really glad to have that picture. My sister and her girlfriends used to just wait for blocks every time the new band came to the Palladium. It was a really big deal in Hollywood. And then, of course, uh, in Philadelphia, they had the Trocadero. They did not tear it down. Uh, but they remodeled it, and they have um, rock bands and things there. And a girl wrote me just a couple months ago. She said, guess what? The owner decided to put in a burlesque show one night, and it was so big they thought they'd lose their rock band the audience. Mm -hmm. No, they didn't. It was the same thing, packed every night. So he's going to put burlesque, well, a couple of the other people. Burlesque has made a new... Mm -hmm. Yeah, in San Francisco, some people are trying to put oh, shows back yes, together. Yes. They're kind of like vaudeville burlesque. Yes, yes, yes. They, and well, they're popular. You know? Oh, uh, yes, uh, I know, Tisha Yeah, right, a little yeah. girl named Baby Doe. Yeah, she puts those big shows on, yeah. and I tell you, she goes out and rents a lot. Those theaters don't come cheap. cheap. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, it costs a lot of money, security guards, fire marshals, everything, yeah. Art Carney, Jackie Gleason, Lord knows how many would have got their start in a burlesque show. And then, of course, we had lots of uh, varieties of uh, dancers. We had Chinese. Now, like this little girl's promo, way up there, it says, the best teas come from China. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had uh, girls from Japan. We had, this is Miss Pei King of 1957. Uh, I worked with her in 1957. And then we had Balinese. We also had a lot of girls from um, Cairo, uh, belly dancers, mm -hmm. was very popular in the burlesque theaters. They were always the star, and a lot of us girls couldn't understand, how come they're not, but you know, they were very good and authentic, mm -hmm. really good. Mm -hmm. They've got a, you probably know, they got a whole street in New York, at least they did anyway, just one place after the other, this belly dancers one, kabukis and stuff. At any rate, uh, and we also had... Uh, a lot of American Indian girls. I got a couple more pictures I got to put up. They would strut across the stage, you know, with these big Indian feather headdresses, and uh, some of them were real Indian princesses. I know, because I was in Kansas City, and this woman called me up and invited me between shows to come to her little apartment for lunch, and she said, Now you tell all the girls on the circuit that my daughter, Princess Lahoma, is a real Indian princess. I said, Okay. <laughs> Because a lot wow. of them come from Europe. I'm a countess and, <laughs> yeah. you know, and things like that. <laughs> now this room, we had rain damage here, and we just finally got around to putting this trunk back together. And, and then when they put these the lights up, we have to take things down. So anyway, it's pretty junky. It has to be uh, straightened up again. At any rate, uh, when World War II broke out, well, of course, a lot of young fellas came from different parts of the country, and, oh, they've never seen a burlesque show, you know, or anything. And uh, so it was a big deal. The Follies Theater downtown Los Angeles had 40 girls in the chorus line alone wow. during the 40s, yes. So you could imagine, for like 25 cents yeah. in the afternoon, here's 40 girls marching forward to the latest song of the day in a Latin dance team. And lots of entertainers. It was uh, really a, a very... And another thing, the burlesque shows, like I said, there's no stage weights. They just mm -hmm. ran One on. Effort. So you were royally entertained for 
that two and a half hours, whenever you're in that theater, you are entertained. Now this is Gypsy Rose Lee's trunk right here. It's got her real name, Louise Hovick, on the back. And that's Gypsy's hat, and those are Gypsy's shoes. And then, of course, in 1941, President Roosevelt put the Japanese in the internment camps. And overnight, there was no one to work in the fields. I was the first girl out of 30 in the state of California to volunteer to do the migrant work. Wow. And I loved it. I'd never seen a cow. <laughs> uh, for a city girl to see a cow, it's a big deal. But then, after one season in the fields, we found out about those young, good-looking cadets over in Bakersfield <laughs> trying to learn how to fly an airplane. So I transferred my war efforts over there, and uh, uh, that's a training plane. There were several different types of training planes. Um, and the young cadets, you see, would slide in and rip off those those wheels right there, and it was my job to put them on. I only weighed about 84 pounds, and those uh, struts weighed about 84 pounds, too. At one time, if you got a minute for a funny story, I don't I'm know, sure. this one girl, she just laughs every time she hears it. Uh, I had a crew chief, and he drove me over there be, uh, early in the morning uh, one day, and he see, that's got a, something over the covering now. But in the windows, he said at night, the... Um, sand and rocks are pitting the glass of the airplane. So he sent me over there early in the morning, and um, I had my big roll of brown paper and masking tape, and it was about maybe 15 or 20 of these airplanes, tip to tip. They taxied them right up the wings. It gets a, not hot. I just decided to take my clothes off. Well, I took everything <laughs> off, and I was jumping from one wing to the other. And then, and then all of a sudden, you know, I see little jeeps and flags. Well, you see, on every airfield, I found out, they have a tower, and there's a fellow on duty up there with binoculars. <laughs> you have to look for uh, fires uh, uh, on an airfield. Well, They weren't looking for fires <laughs> No, <right. laughs> at that point. Now, and so now he calls another fellow to come up, and he says, my God, he says, you'll never believe this. There's a naked blonde out there <laughs> jumping from wing to wing on the airplanes. He says, and so he said, quick, get the, get the uh, uh, major. Get the, and so they, all of a sudden, I'm, a, I'm still naked, jumping, running on these wings. And now it's getting a little warm, it's getting a little hot, but I didn't care. Uh, now I see a little teeny-weeny jeep like this, because, you know, it's real far away how little they look. Oh, I got plenty of time. So then when there was two, two jeeps with little flags flying, and now the little jeeps are getting a little bigger, a little bigger. Pretty soon by that time, I got my clothes on, I'm sitting on the wing of the plane. And the major says... Is your crew chief Bud McCullough? And I said, yes, sir, he is. He said, well, he went off the post and he came back drunk. And he said, uh, two, so we see he's on a three-day suspension. <laughs> so he was never going to come back and pick me up uh, after lunch. So, you know. But anyway, he said, get in the back jeep back there. But I tell you, more crazy things happen on an airfield. When you're very young, they like to send you to do crazy things. Now, that wasn't exactly crazy because it was to cover the glass, yeah. you know, with the paper. So the rocks didn't hit it. But anyway. But that's yeah. how you were in World War II. That's how At you did World your War kind II. of bit yeah. in World yeah. War II. I didn't realize that the Japanese were the ones that har were harvesting, not Mexicans at that point in time. Uh, well, yeah, the Japanese controlled all of uh, California's uh, produce. And they lost that when they well, got Well, incurred, yes, that's true. Yeah. When, uh, but wow. President Roosevelt, uh, we, they imported 10,000 Mexicans to work in the fields to take wow. over. And the uh, Japanese, I heard them interviewed about 20 years ago, they never went back to the fields and they were glad because uh, they went into different yeah, things yeah. and, you know, That's and didn't go back mm. to uh, the migrant work and the Mexicans never took over. Who was going to pick the things after that? Yeah, That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, it cool. was, uh, it was uh, we're, I, well, Blaze Star, I worked in the celery fields. Uh, uh, Tempest Storm picked cotton. Wow. She was a cotton. Can you imagine that? Wow. A gorgeous, beautiful girl, uh, yeah, a cotton yeah. picker. <laughs> and Blaze Star uh, hoeing corn and picking ginseng. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> I did not want anything in this room except Marilyn Monroe. But since she did it, I couldn't say a thing about it because she did buy the material and did a lot of things. So that whole wall is me. And that's where it says, gentlemen, I must inform you I'm the attorney for Marilyn Monroe, where she was going to sue me. Wow. Now, 
I think the reason she didn't sue me was I would assume that her attorney probably said, Marilyn, why are you suing this girl? She has nothing. You have everything. Because in 1956, she had more press than any human being on the planet, <laughs> and probably since then, I would imagine. Now, see, I was not the Marilyn Monroe Bullet. I didn't call myself that, no. I'm from Hollywood, and I did a little act. What does a girl have to do in order to get a job in the movies? <laughs> so, wow. I, <laughs> so when I went to New York, Mr. Minsky, now we know that's a big name, yeah. Yeah. he said, you look like Marilyn. I'm going to call you the Marilyn Monroe of burlesque. I said, Mr. Minsky, they'll throw tomatoes. I can't go through with this. But you see, it gave me a gimmick. Yeah. And in my industry, you had to have some kind of a gimmick. Yeah. And then not only that, it's a serious business back east. I mean, you know, uh, if you're using Night Train or, the, oh boy, another. I've been using Night Train for six years. Oh boy, big fights over the music. <laughs> oh, yes. At 9 o'clock in the morning, you, you go down the basement and the, and the band is there and you rehearse. And, uh, and I used to use night train when I was doing just straight uh -huh. strip. And um, one girl would leap up off the, the little chair and she'd run to the piano, uh, how long she's been using it. And then another girl <laughs> said, well, I've been using Harlem Nocturne. It's in my contract. And boy, they <laughs> screech and scream. And I thought, well, Mr. Minsky got me this Marilyn Monroe. I'm out of that trap with yeah. these girls with the music. Because there's only a, so many standard songs. And boy, if you're a hardcore stripper bumping, but you want those songs yeah. are just tailor-made yes you can't just use any kind of mm -hmm. music. no it's got to be certain way at any rate this was where i uh, used to uh my last show was quarter of five in the morning and uh, so anyway i did not mean to make fun of marilyn i adored no. marilyn i loved her as millions and millions of us did uh, but like i said i had to work and i had to work every day all the time and uh, we had regular theatrical agents in those days. And so when Marilyn died, uh, it, uh, I didn't grieve for my lost career. It was Marilyn is gone from the world forever. And it was the biggest shock to me, I tell you. It was, and I went into this horrible depression. Wow. Thank goodness for my husband. He was selling aluminum siding at that time. He'd been out of the prize fights for wow. a little while. And we'd, we'd met Rodney Dangerfield a couple times. He was aluminum siding salesman. Oh, really? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And a couple, yes, uh-huh. Wow. There was a couple little bars in New Jersey where we'd all meet sometimes in the afternoon and discuss the business. business. How, I don't know. It was, you got to make these people sign. The, now, see, the reason they liked my husband, he was very handsome, and he was a good front man, because the minute the husband found out he was a fighter, oh, now they got something to talk yeah, about. Yeah. Then the closers come. The closers, two of them that I remember very well, look just like the Booze Brothers, you know, with yeah. the dark glasses <laughs> on the back. They always say, I've got to go to Jamaica, you know. Yeah. And always going to the racetrack, you know, and that kind of stuff. They were hardcore closers and they were scary. Even my husband used to come home and he'd say, Oh, Dixie, I'm so sick. These poor little couple didn't want to sign the contract, you know, and they couldn't get out of it. They were a little afraid, you know, because these guys are so intimidating. intimidating. And I know after meeting them a couple of times, oh, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey. So, anyway, uh, so when she died, he started doing, was a lot better making more money. Now, is that Marilyn or is that you? No, that's me. That's oh, yeah, you. no. I, oh, that's, me. That looks amazingly like Marilyn. I know. A fellow said, I've never seen that yes. picture of Marilyn before. I said, well, it's not. It was taken in uh, Hawaii uh, at a nightclub where I work, uh, the Matsuoka, June Matsuoka. Her son took that uh, on the stage. At, uh, and that's her black kimono. June Matsuoka. I had a pink Cadillac like that in 1958 oh, or 59. Wow. I really forget exactly. And anyway, he it's kind of exaggerated because he commits suicide at the end. The blood is coming down. He run, Lee J. Cobb runs in the house and says, you don't have to do it. She just got hit on Hollywood Boulevard with a bus and she's dead. And then they see the blood. Anyway, they could have probably got lawyers in those days. <laughs> and anyway, that was the storyline. But... Uh, why they used my name and me, I think I know. <laughs> I had worked for the telephone company. And I talked to a lot of movie stars, and I knew their phone numbers. And I used to write them down on my fingers. Then I'd put them in a ledger. 
And then I'd write wonderful fantasy things like I knew all these movies, but, and I didn't. It was, all, it was all a lie. And I lost the book at um, Andy McIntyre's, uh, uh, and Marilyn Maxwell, I think he was married to Marilyn oh. Maxwell. It was a nightclub. I'm trying to think of the name of it, I might. And, I, and that book, Ledger, would not fit in this cocktail bag. And I, and I couldn't find it, so I know I left it there at... Uh, uh, the Encore Room, I think it was called, on uh, La Cienega. At any rate, I think that's where they got my no. name. I have this wall here vacant for a girl who passed away. I took care of her. Her name was Mitzi. Her mother and father were the Dancing McGarrities in uh, Vaudeville. And uh, we have a, her urn and everything, but we just haven't got time to do it right yet. More Gypsy Rose Lee things. And then uh, Candy Bar, the notoriously famous Little Miss Candy Bar. She was out here in 93, I think, and brought me that gold lettuce from Texas. She was sentenced to the penitentiary and got in a lot of problems, but a lot of them wasn't her fault, no. See, she worked for Jack Ruby, who oh, shot Oswald. Oh, right, yeah. And Maybe, then yeah. also the uh, Chicago Mobsters had built one casino after the other in Las Vegas, uh, I mean in Havana. So they wanted to take uh, Cuba back right after Castro. So there were five people waiting in Havana the minute the demise of Castro happened. And Jack Ruby had smuggled things many, many times uh, into Cuba. So they said, Jack, your job is to take the poison cigars to Castro. Well, Ca he had no trouble getting in and out of customs because he'd been going in and out of Cuba for a long time, Jack Ruby. Well, Castro is a very huge man and he rallied on his deathbed for two weeks, but when he got off of that deathbed, he had those five fellows executed immediately because he sort of had a hunch that they were trying to take over, you know. Yeah. So uh, they, that deal fell through. Uh, they. Uh, sent Candy Bar to a nightclub in Washington, D.C. to keep all messages going to the president, but it didn't work any longer. Everything fell through. At any rate, she, she did have to go to the penitentiary, and she knew a little bit about a lot of things. Now, this is the wonderful Blaze Star. I'm in touch with Blaze Star. That was worn in the motion picture Blaze, and those are the underneath things uh, that Blaze uh, oh. had. Uh, yep, she, she's the one that I told you was hoeing corn and picking ginseng. Yeah. <laughs> she's right back uh, where she started from. When she made all her money, she added a couple of rooms on the house in the, what they call the holler, you know, in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah she, she, now, that's a smoking couch. Her lungs are in very bad shape right now. See, I don't have enough room to display things properly, you know, as if I had enough room, you know big place, you know. Gosh, if I had the money they spend in Vegas, just one little flat. <laughs> yeah, really. I could build a great, I got a lot of things in storage, too. The one and only Lily St. Cyr. There she is with Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> Lily St. Cyr, we all looked up to Lily, every one of us. She was just incredibly beautiful, incredibly talented. All of her acts were very special. Can you imagine coming on stage with a real matador? Uh, that act was called Carmen Escu. In fact, all of Lily's photographs have a name. They're not just a number. And of course, the uh, do the ballet in the front with the matador, and then um, the, then you'd hear the uh, bull goring the matador to death, and then you see the, the him going off in the gurney and the stage way up, you know, and his cape, ah. Oh, his cape was encrusted with jewels and real elaborate and ballerina. She said, Grandma, that's what I want to do. So her father was giving her dancing lessons. But there's a song. How you gonna keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? Her father, handsome captain in the United States Army, well, he fell in love with a French girl in Paris, and he never went back to the Ozarks. Sally was... Uh, 12 years old, plucking feathers out of chicken, chopping wood, and on her 13th birthday, a carnival came through town. 
and away went Helen Gould back. Well, she was plucking feathers out of chicken and chopping wood, and all of a sudden on her 13th birthday, uh, a carnival came through that itty-bitty town, and away went Helen Gould Beck. She danced all over the United States in circuses and carnivals, but in 1926, she signed a big movie contract with Cecil B. DeMille. <gasps> Everything is wonderful for her. He gave her the name of Sally Rand, and... Uh, uh, she brought the mother out from the Ozarks, her little brothers and sisters. She put a deposit on a little bungalow in Hollywood. And then along came talkies. <laughs> and she had a lisp. Came across the screen like a sputter and a hiss. So Cecil B. DeMille canceled her contract. She's washed up. She's finished. She hadn't got a dime. She did have enough money to scramble to Chicago. She opened up the big newspaper. There it is. Auditioning this afternoon at the Paramount Club. Gotta get a job. Well, she hadn't finished her ballet dress because she had studied ballet. She was never going to give that up. So she had picked up these two fans on the way to the, uh, from a thrift shop on the way to the hotel in Chicago. She grabbed the fans, jumped in a cab, ran down, auditioned, got the job. That night, she had her beautiful chiffon gown on and she did her ballet. The people liked it. She'd do back bends and, while they're drinking and visiting. And the boss said, I didn't like that act. I like that thing you did this afternoon with no clothes and the big pink fans. Well, now we have the most famous fan dancer in the entire world, Miss Sally Rand. 1933 is approaching, the big World's Fair. This is going to be the biggest thing that's ever happened to Chicago. And people within a thousand miles of Chicago are hoping and praying something's got to give. Something's got to break the back of the Depression. Well, Sally won a little part of that fair, too. But the commissioner said, Miss Rand, this is a prestigious fair. We can't have the likes of anyone that's been working in a gin mill and a speakeasy on the south side. Not in this fair, Missy. Well, she walked into the club that night. The tears are streaming down her face. She looked up at Big Jim Gigliotto, the bartender, and she said, Jim, I bet you every bit of money in the whole wide world that a lady could die for. Rode in there on her horse. Eh, commissioners at that fair. They wouldn't talk to her either. The night before the World's Fair opened, they had erected this huge pavilion, a hundred dollars a plate dinner for all the elite of Chicago. There's a little promenade they can stroll with their folks. And on the other side is a little podium. And the commissioners are saying, ladies and gentlemen, your investments are sound. And all of a sudden, clippity-clop, clippity-clop, clippity What is this coming down the promenade? It's a big, white, prancing horse with a nude Sally Rand. <laughs> and she's riding bareback. And she's riding side saddle with a garland of flowers around one ankle. And the people, they pull their heads up from the dinner and they scream, we're going to have Lady Godiva. <laughs> and the commissioners are saying, get the journalists. Don't let them get out of this park. You know who that girl is. Too late, front page of the Chicago Tribune. What a miraculous feat our World's Fair has pulled off tomorrow. We're going to have Lady Godiva. Every major news agency in America had called and said, we are on our way to Chicago. We want to interview uh, Lady Godiva. Calls came from Covington, England. We are making preparation to come to America. We want to interview this person who is calling herself Lady Godiva. Well, they had to go down to the club and say, Miss Rand, we've reconsidered. We're going to book you into the streets of Paris at $75 a week. Within six weeks, they rose her salary to $1,000 a week. And she pulled Chicago out of financial ruin with these two fans. These are the original fans here that uh, Sally uh, had. And uh, that, she was tiny, real tiny. This suit she wore in the 50s time and she puts on put on a big uh, show in uh, uh, Los Angeles at the Palace Theater downtown three thousand uh, dollars a uh, fundraiser and she's my best supporter <laughs> so you that's know, what no, happens yeah that's okay. Margie Hart up there now she was married to uh, assemblyman John Ferraro I don't know whether John Ferraro is still alive I'm not sure really yeah, he was married to Margie Hart, yeah. Okay. 
Well, thank you very much. Thank you well, so much. thank you for your very, donation. Very that was really, thank really you. nice. And uh, you know where we oh, are. And you. I hope sometime you get to come back <laughs> again. Yeah, we would well, love to. Well, we have new things happening all the time, you know. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you Thanks so for letting much. me take pictures. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, anytime. You know, don't trip over that. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a good one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, it, it, well, the place is pretty tumbledy down right now, but after the reunion, it's just, we have to get back to Cody. Uh, or she we have one to follow day through with everything the county tells us to do. You know, those lights, not only the lights, the electrical, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then for them to come out and inspect the place, that's the charge of $300 yeah, that's always a pain. to come out. Sure inspect you know so it goes on and on and on yeah. so we had to comply with them because we already went to an attorney yeah. and they said you have to do everything to do they it. said <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 